Welcome back. We are continuing our story of The Wild Robot by Peter Brown. So if you have not watched the previous video, make sure you do that so you are on the correct chapters. And as always, I will put the chapters that I'm reading in the title of this video. If you would like to invite your family, join them for a read aloud and get in a cozy position and let's get started. So we are on chapter six, the climb. So crack, thunk, clang. Ross was having a little trouble climbing the cliffs. She had a dent on her rear and a long scrape down her side. She was just about to get another ding when a crab scuttled out from a piece of driftwood. The crab looked up and immediately showed off his giant claw. Everyone was afraid of his claws, but not the robot. She just looked down and introduced herself. Hello, crab. My name is Roz. After a brief standoff, the crab cautiously backed away. And then when Roz noticed how easily he moved over the rocks, with his stance, with his wide stance and grippy feet, the crab could crawl up and down any rock surface. So Roz decided to try out his climbing technique. She spread her arms wide and clamped on each hand onto the cliff side. She jammed one foot into a crack and lifted her other foot onto a narrow ledge, and just like that, she was climbing. Roz moved awkwardly at first. A chunk of rock crumbled in her hand, and she had trouble finding footholds. But as she climbed higher and higher, she started to get the hang of it. Seagulls squawked from their cliff next and soared away when the robot came too close. But Roz paid them no mind. She was only focused on getting to, to the top. Up, up, up she went, climbing past nests and ledges and tiny trees rooted in the crack. And before long, our robot felt the soft soil of the island beneath her feet. Chapter 7, The Wilderness Animal sounds filled the forest, chirps and bing wing beats and rustlings in the underbrush. And then, from the sea cliffs, there came a new sound, heavy crush crunching footsteps. The forest animals fell silent and from their hiding places they watched as the sparkling new monster stomped past. But that forest was not a comfortable place for Roz. Jagged rocks and fallen trees and tangled underbrush made it difficult for her to walk. She stumbled along, struggling to keep her balance. Her foot snagged and she toppled over into a piece of timber. It wasn't a bad fall. No dings, no dents, no dirt. But Roz was programmed to keep herself in good working order. And once she was back on her feet, she immediately began cleaning herself off. Her hands darted around her body, quickly brushing off any and every speck of dirt. Only when the robot was sparkling again did she continue through the forest. Rod stumbled on until she found a patch of ground that was flat and open and carpeted with pine needles. It seemed like a safe place and safety was all the robot really wanted. So she stood there motionless, all perfect lines and angles set against the irregular shapes of the wilderness. Chapter eight, the pine cones. If you stand in a forest long enough, eventually something will fall on you. And Roz had been standing in the forest long enough. A gentle wind whispered through the treetops and then thunk, a pine cone bounced off her head. The robot looked down and watched the pine cone roll to a stop. It seemed harmless, so Roz went right back to doing nothing. A few hours later, a gust of wind rushed through the treetops and then thunk. The robot looked down and another pine cone rolled away. Then, a few hours after that, a howling wind tore through the treetops. It bent trunks and shook branches and then thunk, thunk, thunk. The pine cones began raining down. Thunk, thunk. Roz felt something like annoyance. Thunk. She quickly scanned the area for somewhere safe from the pine cones, and she spotted the perfect place. So she went, when she looked up, a huge rocky shape that towered above the forest. Chapter 9, The Mountain. Roz was now stomping her way up the mountain. Dense forest and rocky outcrops forced the robot to zig and zag and backtrack. But after an hour of steady hiking, she arrived at the Crangy Mountain Peak. 
Grasses and flowers and shrubs sprouted out from every pocket of soil, but there was no trees at the top. Roz was safe from those annoying pine cones. She dusted herself off and carefully climbed up the leaning slab of stone to the highest point of the entire mountain. The robot slowly turned her head around, completely around. She saw the ocean stretching to the horizon in every direction. And in that moment, Roz learned what you and I have known since the beginning of this story. In that moment, Roz finally realized that she was on an island. Roz looked down and surveyed the island. Starting from the sandy southern point, the island grew wider and greener and hillier until it finally jutted up the rocky cone of the mountain. In some places, the mountain fell away, leaving sheer cliffs. A waterfall rushed off of one cliff and fed a river that wound its way through the great meadow of the center of the island. The river flowed past wildflowers and ponds and boulders and then disappeared into the forest. Blurry shapes suddenly cut through the robot's vision. She focused her eyes and saw vultures circling above the foothills. Then she noticed lizards warming themselves on distant rock. A badger peeked out from a berry bush. A moose waded through a stream. A flock of sparrows turned into imperfect unison above the tree. The island was teeming with life. And now it had a new kind of life, a strange kind of life artificial life. Chapter 10, The Reminder. I should remind you, reader, that Roz had no idea how she had come to be on that island. She didn't know that she had been built in a factory and stored in a warehouse before crossing the ocean on the cargo ship. She didn't know that a hurricane had sunk the ship and left her crate floating on the wave for days until it was finally washed ashore. She didn't know that she accidentally activated was accidentally activated by those curious sea otters. As the robot looked out at the island, it never occurred to her that she might not belong there. As far as Roz knew, she was home. Chapter 11, The Robot Sleeps. Roz stood on the peak and watched the sun sink behind the ocean. She watched slowly, watched the shadow slowly spreading over the island and up the mountainside. She watched the stars come out one by one until the sky was filled with million points of life, of light. It was the first night of the robot's life. She activated her headlights and suddenly bright shafts of light were beaming from her eyes, illuminating the whole mountaintop too bright, so she dimmed them. Then she turned them off and sat in darkness and listened to the chorus of the nighttime chirps. After a while, our robot's brain decided it was a good time to conserve energy, so she sat and anchored herself to the rocks. Her no, not, her non-essential program switched off, and then, in her own way, the robot fell asleep. Chapter 12, The Storm. Roz felt safe on the mountaintop, so she spent the next few days and nights perched on its peak. But everything changed one afternoon when a low-flying cloud crept up the mountain. Roz found herself surrounded by white. When the world faded back into view, she noticed the clouds floating south past the island. Then she heard a deep rumble behind her. The robot turned around and saw the sky was filled with swirling wall of darkness. Light flickered here and there and more deep rumbles. A storm was approaching, and it wasn't just any storm. It was as fierce as the one that had sent the cargo ship to the ocean floor. The wind picked up, and the first drops of rain tapped against the robot. It was time to go. Roz unclamped her hands and began sliding down the peak. Hot sparks flew from her body, scraping against the leaning slab of stone. As soon as her feet hit the soil, she was off and running. The rain fell fell harder. The wind blew faster. The lightning flashed brighter. The thunder cracked louder. So much rain water was falling into the rushing rivers of runoff started springing up everywhere. Roz splashed down the mountain, searching through the gloom for any kind of shelter, but she, but she should have watched where she was going. Her heavy feet slipped and tripped and she tumbled off into a mountain mudslide. Our robot was helpless. The river of the mud whisked her down the downhill, slamming her into rocks and dragging her through the bushes and sweeping her straight toward a cliff. Mud was pouring off the cliff like a waterfall. Roz frantically clawed at the ground, grasping for anything she could hold on to, but the flow only carried her faster toward the edge. 
Just as she was about to plunge over the side, she came to a hard, sudden stop. Mud surged around her, sprang into her face and pinning her against some solid thing. She blindly felt with her hands and recognized thick roots of a trunk of a pine tree. In an instant, she was pulling herself into the branches. The wind whipped across the mountainside and Roz heard a familiar thunk of the pine cone, pelting her body. She didn't mind them then. She was just happy to be safe from the mud flow. The robot locked her arms and legs around the tree and waited for the storm to blow over. All right, this is where we are going to stop for today. So come back tomorrow and we will continue reading.